labor in one place since the last time I visited my new grandchildren at the hospital <laughs> nursery. <laughs> and uh, if it's any comfort to, to you, uh, Larry, about your, your purple shirt, things are almost worse for me today. I, uh, in our hotel room a little while ago, I went to put on uh, my basic blue suit and my blue trousers were missing. And that's why you've got this stunning outfit with the tans. <laughs> and uh, I want to assure you that this is the first time I have ever had trouble finding my pants in a hotel. <laughs> right, Sharon? <laughs> I come among you uh, tonight from a, another time, a, a time when people were better at sorting truth from fibs and facts from malicious fiction. A time where the best fact checkers of all were the well-informed American voters themselves. I come to you from 1937, the year I was born. I come to you from World War II and its immediate aftermath, a time when the people of this nation consumed so much news and magazines, newspapers, radio, and television that life was more difficult for political charlatans than for other snake oil salesmen. I come here tonight nearly 76 years old after a lifetime of reading, reporting, and commenting on the news, and I am troubled about a fundamental weakness, a virtual disease in our democracy that clouds the judgment of the people. They have abandoned their homework as voters. They have become a pushover for the closed-minded and corrosive politics of this era. And so I come to you tonight from a new nation, America the gullible. As we begin this evening of constructive partisanship, well-deserved uh, salutes to Art Manley. He was uh, a liberal giant in the Idaho legislature of all places. I give you a fair warning. I have become a political agnostic in recent years. That development may be a consequence of the new wisdom of growing older, or perhaps it is merely a manifestation of a tattered brain. Whatever the cause, I have become a left-leaning centrist. I don't believe in one perfect political party that is always right, or one adult political party that is always wrong. Mind you, I still have a few clear preferences. I believe that as a general rule, Democrats are more inclined than Republicans to vote primarily to help others. I believe that a higher percentage of Republicans than of Democrats vote primarily to help themselves. The Democrats believe to a strong degree, stronger than Republicans do, that they are their brother's keeper. On the other hand, quite a few Republicans believe that their brothers are all just lazy spongers trying to get into their pockets. <laughs> As uh, my old mentor, the late Perry Swisher, once said of 1964 presidential candidate uh, Barry Goldwater, he believes that barefoot people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Yeah. <laughs> That's the very heart of what the uh, U.S. House of Representatives is about these days. However, I insist that there are still many Republicans with a generous nature, a heartfelt concern for others, and a memory of where they came from. 
Unfortunately, there are only about 400 such Republicans left in the Idaho GOP who haven't been accused of human kindness and run out of the state by their own self righteous brethren. However, while I tend to tilt most of the time for the Democrats and liberal ideals, I would be embarrassed to be so close-minded as to line up entirely with one side of the spectrum or the other. People who think like that, uh, whether Tea Party Republicans or Marijuana Party uh, Democrats, <laughs> should be offered uh, tea counseling uh, front of the state home for the irrationally idealistic. <laughs> That's why I abuse your kind hospitality by warning you that I'm a political agnostic. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I have read Barack Obama's book on what he stood for. Uh, I uh, didn't know much about him at the time. I was astonished to find most of what I believed, 95% uh, in that book. And so the, the, the far left Democrats who complain about his uh, not helping the, the, the far left and uh, the far right uh, people in this country saying he's a socialist uh, uh, don't know their, uh, their hair from a hole in the ground. Uh, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a perfectly uh, or utterly worthless president uh, in either party. I don't recognize, can some of you handle that, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's going to have asked. <laughs> I don't uh, recognize a democratic Jesus or a holy moly Republican ghost. As for the one great president of heaven and earth and of conventional religion, there are days when wonderful things happen to make me believe there is a God. For instance, when I go to the store and see the drumsticks, or see them here tonight, the best part of the chicken costs far less than the dry white chicken breast, I want to shout there is a God. <laughs> when I met my wife, and to my astonishment, she actually agreed to marry me, her eyesight's not great, <laughs> I had an inkling that uh, there really is somebody up there looking after me, and it is Rick Santorum, Mick Romney, or John Stewart. <laughs> it's better than that. It's, uh, it's good to have a super being watching over us. But I'm not much of a churchgoer, except to bid goodbye to the dearly departed of my generation. Other than that, it often seems to me that if there is a God, he is probably some nice old guy like Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan, who means well, but who is not very good at his job and keeps knocking over the global furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I offer that observation on Reagan and Carter without questioning his good intentions. I readily admit that I would be even that I would be even worse as a president or at becoming an omnipotent de a deity than they have been. And I say that while conceding that both Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan were better at their jobs than most members of today's U.S. House of Representatives are at theirs. But it's not a compliment. <laughs> Before I get into the meat, or perhaps I should say the chicken drumsticks of tonight's main serving, let me offer you six short appetizers on uh, how to uh, get our country back on the straight and rational. Number one, raise the personal financial price on going to war and revive the draft for men and women. Yeah. You people are even smarter than I heard. <laughs> The minute a war starts, put a 10% surcharge on everyone's income tax, leaving it in place until the war ends. The tax would not only pay for the war, but would take a bite out of our incomes. That would hurt enough to provide a motive to make us truly serious before rushing into another war. In addition, resurrecting the draft would threaten us all with the sobering sacrifice of possibly losing loved ones. During World War II, men, women, and children paid a price in fear, blood, and taxes every day to stop Hitler. Our recent wars have been left almost entirely to the warriors and to their lonely families. Going to war should place everybody's skin on the line. Henceforth, we all go to war or nobody goes to war. I think that one would really work. Most of what I propose is laughed at in the Idaho legislature, places like that. Number two, throw New Hampshire and Iowa out of the union. <laughs> it's possible. It would serve them right for their self-centered domination of when the presidential election period begins and for their unilateral occupation of the first two places in line to narrow the field of candidates. Then create a national primary election that involves everyone simultaneously, 
and make that national primary election day no earlier than May 1st of a presidential year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Number three, let's all of us, liberal and conservative, recognize two lost causes that are never going to happen and should stop occupying our time. The government is not going to take our guns away. And the government is not going to eject 11 million immigrants from our country. Never gonna happen. As they say in Brooklyn, forget about it. <laughs> Number four, minimize conflicts of interest in Congress. If a federal judge is caught taking money from someone with business before his bench, the judge will go to prison for it. The same should be true of members of Congress who, uh, for instance, serve on armed services committees and take campaign contributions from the defense industry. Right. Members of Congress should be as ethical as federal judges. Number five, in this country, a rich person and a poor person get the same vote. It's one per customer. Similarly, each citizen, rich or poor, gets the same four or five minutes to address the city council, the school board, or, or uh, the county commission. Why then should wealthy voters be permitted the huge, overpowering voice of massive amounts of campaign advertising? If political advertising is speech, as the reckless Supreme Court contends, then why should a billionaire's speech be so much louder than ours? Let's limit every citizen and corporation in the land to a level playing field of no more than a $100 cop contribution per candidate. Well, that's not much money in the campaign, but every, it'll be a level playing field. Everybody uh, uh, will have not much money. They might have to just go out and earn an election instead of having to buy it. <coughs> number, uh, number six, approximately 15% of the population of Idaho is made up of Latinos, 70% of whom were born in this country, and yet few of them vote. Por que mis amigos Latinos no votan? <laughs> Why, my Latino friends, don't you vote? And why, my Idaho Democratic friends, aren't you out knocking on Latin doors tonight instead of listening to me? Woo! That's not too tough listening. <laughs> so what's wrong with America the gullible? The real question is what's wrong with the voters? The evidence is overwhelming that the voters of today are not nearly uh, as well informed or as inclined to think about anybody but themselves as the voters were a half a century ago. Today's population is mostly an ill-informed and stingy collection of self-absorbed voters. It is the voters themselves who are most at fault in the present overdose of historically timid politicians in Congress and in state legislatures. After all, who put these lightweights in office if not the people themselves? It wasn't the tooth fairy. While most members of Congress and the state legislature are no prize when it comes to leadership, they are mostly the inept result of an incompetent and gullible electorate. How did that happen? First of all, it stems from all those on the far right and on the far left who treat their politics like a rabid religion rather than like a practical process for sorting out what changes our nation needs. A massive part of the problem is that voters today don't consume much uncolored news. Many among us watch the most heavily slanted cable channels and read all the narrow-minded internet dribble that feeds us imaginary facts. A generation ago, there were only three, te three television channels and many newspapers that provided tons of news and only a little opinion. If the president was giving a speech or a political party was having a nominating convention, those events were on all three channels. A couple of you look like you're older enough to, uh, old enough to remember that. <laughs> and for half an hour each night, the three channels provided nothing but news. If you watch television at all in those circumstances, that was what you got. It was much harder then to avoid news. Today, most communities have access to hundreds of channels of television. It is easy to avoid straight news, including presidential speeches and reports on Congress or the state legislature. <coughs> Who wants to know what's going on in Washington when you can bury yourself in bass fishing shows, cooking programs, wrestling, New Jersey housewives, and Victoria's Secret fashion shows of the latest satin knickers? <laughs> oh, there's nothing wrong with entertainment shows. I, I have my guilty pleasures on television. Uh, I, I like the, music, uh, the musical show Glee, which is supposed to be for teenagers. Uh, I like Broadway music. Uh, uh, the quiz show Jeopardy and uh, the Seattle Mariners, God rest their soul. <laughs>
please don't tell me what happened to you. But the problem is the high percentage of voters uh, who uh, watch nothing else uh, and leave themselves at the mercy of political con men and women. Most radio stations 50 years ago had straight news every hour on the hour. Do still do. But when I'm a passenger in a car today, not only does the driver rudely keep the radio music on while we try to talk, but if the music is interrupted by news, he pushes a button to avoid learning anything constructive. So we quickly get back to the music. Isn't it odd that so many people run around all day listening to music on those ubiquitous headphones? It's like we're all living a movie of our own lives and we each require our own personal soundtrack. When it comes to discovering what's happening in government, many of today's voters, if they seek news at all, uh, listen to extreme left and right wing radio talk shows. There's a scant market for moderation on top radio, or least of all, for straight on varnished news. News is what's happening. Opinion is what we think should be happening. We don't get much of what's happening on television anymore, but we do get a growing infection of massive one sided opinion peddled by extremists on the left and right. Mind you, I, of all people, do not oppose opinion. I love opinion. I'm giving you opinion right now, like it or not. If you don't like it, turn up your, uh, your soundtrack. For most of my life, I've written almost nothing but opinion. For 38 years, I was the editorial page of the Tribune, a paper that stirs the opinion pot with its mostly liberal editorials, while including the opinions of liberal, conservative, and centrist politicians and readers. So what's wrong with MSNBC and Fox? The difference between them and more conventional news sources is that they are mostly opinion. They provide major servings of straight, uncolored news uh, each day, and most of the time, they give no more than token attention to opposing views. By contrast with MSNBC and Fox and talk radio rants, we have many fair-minded newspapers and ordinary television newsrooms that give no more than about 5% opinion. The other 95% is straight news, sports, weather, entertainment, obituaries, and casserole recipes. Best of all, they sincerely try to give us unvarnished reports on what community, state, and federal governments are doing. And that's why some of us are more inclined to watch CNN, which is less overwhelmed by opinion. When CNN does offer opinion, it routinely invites participants from both sides of the argument. And if CNN's Wolf Blitzer doesn't have an opposition guest to counter a lone senator or governor, he routinely and expertly plays devil's advocate, not letting any absurd remark go unanswered. In truth, a few of the MSNBC and uh, Fox commentators do actually give airtime to people they disagree with. Uh, MSNBC's uh, Rachel Maddow. Yeah. 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 You were going to beat up on me. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would include in that Fox as Chris Wallace. But the bulk of the commentators for MSNBC and Fox are deep in bed with the far left or the far right. Uh, they are day-long servile stooges of the Democratic and Republican parties. A couple of very uh, odd bunches to be servile to. <laughs> Liberal, I didn't mean to look at you, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> Liberals watch MSNBC rather than Fox, and conservatives watch Fox rather than MSNBC, for the same reason that Mormons don't watch Catholic mass broadcasts, and Catholics don't watch broadcasts from the Salt Lake Tabernacle. MSNBC and Fox preach to the political choirs. Liberals and conservatives are those choirs. With both those two cable channels and those two churches, the thrust of programming is not a process of opening minds, it is a process of keeping minds closed. Corrosive conceit of presenting only one side of what's good for America for most of 24 hours each day produces a so-called news report that has contributed to an epidemic of ignorance and gullibility in this country. Oddly enough, one of the major uh, sources of massive misinformation and one of the major antidotes is the same thing, the internet. The internet spreads more gross exaggerations and falsehoods than any information source in history with the possible exception of Rush Limbaugh, the National Enquirer, and the government of North Korea. <laughs> but I don't blame the internet for its fibs. Uh, uh, it's merely a tool, a distribution tool for all information, truthful or otherwise. I could also include uh, among the many sources of lies our public libraries. I say that with respect. 
Libraries carry the great truths of the world, and they carry a lot of untruths. Books contain truth, and books contain lies. Not to mention stupid, unproven theories, inaccurate histories, and many worshipful biographies. Libraries are audible places where all sides, all the arguments meet and try to settle their differences. The same is sometimes true of the internet. The libraries and the internet spread all their facts, lies, and speculations before us. And it's our job to do our homework, to keep our minds open, and try to sort it all out. Most Americans today are doing a lousy job. Fortunately, both libraries and the internet are also amazing sources of rebuttals. The internet is especially useful in helping people prove and disprove questionable elements in public discussion. At its worst, the internet is where millions of closed-minded and naive people share popular fibs of the moment. Obama's alleged Kenyan birthplace, Mitt Romney is outrageously exaggerated by the Democrats' dog abuse and rumors of Sarah Palin's intellectual brilliance. <laughs> so you're not the only one who stupid Sarah jokes. <laughs> I swear you can tell half the people in America that the moon is actually made of green cheese and they would say, where do I get me some of that stuff? Such questions are more easily resolved today by using the internet than by pawing laboriously uh, through all the books in the library. Just as there are sloppy myths and malicious errors flooding into everybody's email from well-meaning but reckless friends, the internet also uh, provides instant baloney detectors. Snopes.com, for yes. instance. Those of you who may not have heard of that, S-N-O-P-E-S. Uh, I especially recommend Snopes, which accurately describes itself as, quote, the definitive internet reference source for urban legends, folklore, myths, rumors, and misinformation. I spend part of my life these days dealing with groundless assertions of massively distributed email lies and myths. My syndicated column goes out with my email address attached uh, so that readers frequently include me in those email broadsides that distribute blatant slanders against Republican and Democratic political figures. But most of the people who send me copies of those <coughs> yarns are not the liars. They are the gullible victims of the liars who originated those hateful scams. Many other recipients are senior citizens uh, who are genuinely alarmed. And so when they send me such things, I look up the rumors on Snopes, make a copy of the debunking information, and send it to the reader who sent it to me, urging him to be more careful in the future. But frankly, what I do is a drop in the bucket of lies that flood the internet every day and scare the hell out of seniors and other innocents. The tragic irony is that careless people witlessly pass along those political lies in much greater volume than the cads who originated that rubbish in the first place. <coughs> Today, voters are mostly at the mercy of their own willful avoidance of accurate information. Many Americans are hopelessly susceptible to the fantasies they want to hear. They want so much to believe the worst of a Barack Obama or a John McCain that they cannot emotionally process ironclad proof that Obama was born in Hawaii or that McCain didn't have a child out of wedlock. As Will Rogers said, the problem ain't what people don't know, it's what they do know that ain't so. 90% of the debate in this country takes place between those who live on the edges of the political spectrum. And yet truth and wise remedies are normally found, often through compromise, somewhere in the middle. Legislation and elections are debated mostly among extremists and their sleazy advertising teams, while elections are ultimately decided somewhere in the center during general elections. They can work well, uh, that rather can work well unless too many primary elections are settled by the rabid right and the hysterical left, as more and more they are today. There is a remedy for that. In the past, the far right and the far left have been outvoted in the primaries as well as in general elections. Uh, but what about voters from the moderate middle? Whatever happened to them in primary elections? There could be uh, more of them if they would not sit in their hands so much and if some of them were not so easy to fool. Politics today parallels eating today. Fat, sugary food on every corner and nobody wants to eat his green beans. And oh, how we love to hang unflattering labels on each other. We call each other by labels that aren't actually awful. I frequently hear people on the left condemn conservatives as capitalists. I hear conservatives identify liberals as socialists. In truth, almost all of us are a blend of both. We're part capitalist and part socialist. 
Anyone including conservatives who supports public schools, public streets, and public fire departments, not to mention our defenders in the military, are practicing socialists. And everybody, including liberals, who support uh, supermarkets, espresso bars, 401ks, iPhones, beauticians, farm, farming, copies of my books, and professional pole dancing are practicing capitalism. <laughs> Anyone who dismisses someone simply for being a conservative or a liberal is confused. We're all conservatives and liberals, both at the same time. True, there are occasional differences. Brushing your teeth each morning is conservative. Brushing your teeth each morning with uh, gin is liberal. <laughs> <laughs> familiar with that. <laughs> we shouldn't spew imaginary insults like whether someone is a liberal or a conservative in an accusatory tone. Uh, both are honorable and useful beliefs. We shouldn't worry about what is the liberal or the conservative thing to do. Ask yourself what is the right thing to do and then figure out later if you wish what the relevant label to hang on. Liberalism and conservatism are not religions, they are directions. Sometimes government appears to have gone uh, too far, such as uh, Lyndon Johnson's binge of new bureaucracies. So we turn to the right for a while. Sometimes a, a government like that of George W. Bush becomes too sluggish uh, to things uh, like unemployment, unregulated banks, hunger, 40,000 Americans dying each year of treatable diseases. And it's time to turn to the left. Putting it another way, liberalism is the accelerator on government. Conservatism is the brick. We can't function as a nation without both. Bill Clinton said pretty much the same thing, and he said it well. America has two great dominant strands of political thought. Conservatism, which at its very best, draws lines that should not be crossed, and progressivism, he kind of weakly calls liberalism, uh, which at its very best breaks down barriers that are no longer needed or should never have been erected in the first place. Clinton is right. Drawing a conservative line that should not be crossed would include preserving the Bill of Rights, free public education, Yellowstone National Park, the Lincoln Memorial, and baseball, except in Seattle. <laughs> some nights are bedrock and should, uh, 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 some things rather are bedrock and shouldn't be toyed with. Almost all Americans are conservative on such issues. On the other hand, breaking down ignorant barriers would include abolishing slavery, guaranteeing the vote to women, passing the 1964 Civil Rights Act and putting out the welcome mat today for brown people, the same as many Americans did for my Danish ancestors. Most Americans are liberals on those issues. Unfortunately, conservatism and liberalism are becoming witlessly regarded by many as virtual religions, as, as I said. Some among us pose as 100% liberal or 100% conservative. That's misguided. Most of these self-described total conservatives will have a fit if they don't get something every month that's called social security. That's yeah. another way of saying socialized security. And ardent liberals will have a hissy fit if you dare tamper with the preservation of wilderness areas. But that's conservatism, pure and simple. If you're a tree hugger, you're conservative. And ardent liberals will have a hissy fit uh, if you, no, I'm asked that. Total liberals and total conservatives behave in their gatherings like people in rigid churches. Go to a liberal meeting and someone begins with a snide remark about the W and George uh, uh, W. Bush standing for weird, and then everyone laughs and applauds. It's kind of a good natured amen for those who don't consider George W. their cup of tea. Uh, they don't even consider him their cup of latte. <laughs> Go to a conservative meeting and Someone makes a snide remark about Hillary Clinton being chubby and everyone laughs and applauds. That's another good nature day, man, for those who are a little twitchy about a woman president and the worst kind of woman at that, a liberal. However, not everyone parked in the pews of a one-sided political gathering is that sophomore. Whether it's a Democratic Central Committee, a, a Republican convention, a feminist gathering, an environmental meeting, a Tea Party harangue, or an actual church, there are always a few sober souls sitting there and secretly disagreeing with the group thing, bless their open mindedness. But they hardly ever comment. They don't dare def differ with the congregation because they care more about being accepted by members of the pack than about correcting erroneous thinking. <coughs> we are pack animals. We are joiners. Few among us want the life of a lone wolf. And it's true that being part of a pack is a natural and useful impulse in our, uh, among our kind. 
brings us together against common foes and common woes and compounds our ability to promote the public good, as you all do regularly. But it isn't always a wise idea. Sometimes honesty and candor are useful to our kind, and the group think uh, stifles a chance to talk things over and wonder aloud if uh, something like the next war is a terrific idea. If extreme liberals and conservatives are going to turn politics into a prayer meeting, then you might as well have some official prayers. It's always an act of uh, guidance and kindness. I've written two such prayers for you tonight. <laughs> this is the conservative prayer. Those of you who uh, will admit being conservative in here, take one knee, please. <laughs> the conservative prayer. Oh, dear God of all the Christians, including most Mormons and some Unitarians, we, we beseech thee to make the poor understand that thou hast blessed us so much more than them because we are better than they are. <laughs> make them realize that it is upsetting to us to have the 47% fighting thy holy gift of capitalism and trying to get our money through Satan's redistribution of our wealth. Lead them not into the temptation of a graduated income tax or of an inheritance tax, which thou hast sanctified with a new name of death tax. And please, Lord, bless the gay folk, the ultra-liberals, the communist state of California, and women in general, for the judgment to be less pushy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Don't laugh too much, Larry. You're going to get yours. <laughs> the liberal prayer. Dear Holy Mother slash Father of Indeterminate Gender, <laughs> please help the conservatives become as good and decent and kind as we are. Please chastise those who smoke in public places for their tendency to be socially inferior to us. <laughs> Melt all the guns in America with your famous fiery wrath and keep us blinded to the virtues of the Second Amendment. We beseech thee to fill the school lunch program with tofu and please don't let vegetarians and flesh eaters marry but let them enter into civil union. <laughs> Dear Lord slash Lordette, most of all, please protect the white wine grapes from untimely blight. <laughs> I have blamed uh, most of what's wrong with America today on the voters, and I do not withdraw that opinion. A democracy, by definition, demands that the people participate and speak their piece competently, and they can't do that without doing their homework. They can't do that by swallowing every myth and fib that they hear on cable or read in their email. And I will point out that the inattention of the electorate has bred uh, a generation of uncommonly cowardly members of Congress. Why is it that members of the military uh, repeatedly risk their lives for their country, but most members of Congress won't even risk losing an election? Why is it that policemen routinely go out there in the night along lonely highways and down dark alleys daring death, but members of the House and Senate tremble in their boots at the thought of defying lobbyists and ignorant voters on matters of principle? Why is it that members of the fire department dare run into a fire to save a child, but most members of Congress don't dare tell a menacing lobby lobbyist with a pot full of cash to put it where the sun don't shine. Most members of Congress would rather become puppets of pressure groups than die a mere political death at the polls. What is it that they fear? <coughs> they fear leaving Congress, their love, their joy, their ego drug. They don't fear for their lives, or least of all for their honor. By comparison with selfless military death, what they fear is a pitiful little setback like losing their current jobs. They fear something that is wonderful by comparison with dying in a war. They fear anonymity. They fear going home and retiring among their grandchildren. Most of all, they fear us, and in one sense, they should. We voters today are a nasty, largely ill-informed, and totally selfish bunch. We behave like rabid badgers, snarling at members of Congress, threatening to bring them home and back down to earth. But that means that the worst we can do is to remove them from office, a fate worse than next to nothing. In many cases, we would be doing them a favor by voting them out of office. We would be rescuing them from the ignominious life of rolling over on their backs like submissive dogs as they encounter each alpha lobbyist with its things full of cash. But we find ourselves with chronically terrified members of Congress who, if they speak their true minds and their honest convictions, fear they will lose, or lose the holy grail of victory in the next election. Why? Is an honorable defeat for too much truthfulness such an awful thing for an ethical person? Is winning an election that important? It's not like members of Congress don't have the golden parachute of lucrative pensions and 
better health insurance than they have ever been willing to provide for the rest of us. Have they ever noticed a, a true leader like Harry Truman who bluntly tells the voters what they need to hear and then goes on to win the election because of his candor and his courage? Losing your life in the military or as a first responder is a tragedy. By contrast, losing a congressional seat is a disappointment. It's the difference between coming home to your family slightly embarrassed and coming home in a box. But you uh, legislators should be embarrassed most of all these recent years that you lost the people's legislative branch to the money forces of greed that you now own. It's not like the military. When we voters defeat you, at least we bring you back alive. We give you back old friends and sweet grandchildren to keep you warm until you die of old age and join our nation's real heroes in a cold, cold ground. America the Gullible has too many minds rusted shut on the far left and the far right. The antidote of the church of the left and the church of the right is to ban the word amen from your gathering. Respectfully question each idea presented in your meetings and do so without fear of excommunication. Any organization that makes you a prisoner of groupthink is not an organization a free citizen of a democratic republic should want to belong to. Let the thought police turn menacing if they will and throw you out the door. That's your badge of courage. Leave your amens behind it. And as you pick yourself up out there on Lonely Street, walk away into an open-minded life, uttering a new mantra, free at last, free at last, great mother slash father, free at last. <laughs>